I guess if I ever get in trouble, I'll just say, where's Nathan? <laughs> now you know how a preacher feels sometimes. <laughs> but you know what? Jesus felt that way. Because I, I can imagine he just wanted to hit those Pharisees over the head. Sometimes, and why don't you get it? Why don't you get it? You know, I love explosions. Anybody love explosions? <laughs> love going to see movies with good explosions? Boy, I, I tell you, I had to go see the Rambo movie because it's about Burma and stuff, but I don't recommend that is the most violent movie I've ever seen. But man, there is one explosion in there that is really a super great explosion. And, and it was worth the price of the movie for that. You know, uh, September 9-11, last year, Russia detonated what they call the father of all bombs. It's a thermobaric bomb that uh, when it was detonated, it had the equivalent of 44 tons of TNT. It's the largest non-nuclear bomb ever detonated, they said. It's four times bigger than the United States thermobaric bomb called, well you can see it there's Moab, which they say is the mother of all bombs. So the Russians beat us with the father of all bombs. And what it is, is actually two, two, uh, de uh, two explosions take place. There's one explosion that, that when it goes off, it, it disperses something in the atmosphere and then another explosion takes place that lights that up and just, it, when it goes off, it just sucks the air out of it. So this, this Russian bomb, for a thousand feet on each side, literally causes everything to cave in. If you're a human, you'll just, you'll just implode. So this is an awesome bomb. It has, it has pressure. It has heat. If you're good at Latin or thermobaric, that's what that means. It, thermo is heat. Barrett is pressure. Now, it's amazing that we're in Acts chapter 2. And let me read verses 1 through 4. And it's my contention that this is much more than what we've thought about in the past. This was a thermobaric bomb going off that made that bomb look tiny. Let's just read the first four verses. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, the past few weeks, I've been having us read a, a prayer about the Holy Spirit. This morning, out of reverence to him, I wanted to just, let's bow our heads right now. Holy Father, as we think back on that day that you had planned since time began, Father, sometimes we just become so used to it. We've heard it a million times. But God, I pray that you would just capture our hearts with the power, the meaning, the preciousness of that day to you in your plan for redemption. And Father, I ask that you would take this church, this uh, humble body of believers, no matter which place we are in, no matter what path each one of us is on, but I pray, God, that you would get our attention I pray, God, that you would take our heart. I pray, God, that you would just let us know what your direction is for our life. And, God, if there is any desire in our heart that is wrong, if there is any purpose in our heart that is contrary to your, your will, I pray, God, that you would take us and direct us into what you want. Father, we praise you for your grace now. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, this, to me, if I was writing this, I would have said a bomb went off. I love, 
I love sounds, don't you? <laughs> what would this world be without sounds? You know, why do I think this is the bomb going off? Well, we'll find out. But it says that a sound, it wasn't a wind, but it was a sound, suddenly appeared and came out. Now, I'll, I'll talk about that later, but what I'm interested in, if this is a bomb, what detonated that bomb? My contention is that it was prayer. <coughs> that prayer was the igniter, the detonator of this bomb that went off that day on Pentecost. Now, um, what were they praying? Your thought? Jesus said, hey, uh, in Acts 1.14 it says they were all with one accord. They were assembled together. They were praying. They were in, in supplication. And, and then if you look at Luke 24.49, Jesus had told them to go and wait until they are clothed with what? Anybody know? With power from on high. And in Acts 1, he had told them, you wait because you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So here they were. They were in, uh, together for about 10 days between the last sighting of Christ when they saw him ascend into heaven. They were praying in, a, in an upper room somewhere. Today, they may have been in the temple uh, because that's when everyone noticed what was going on. But they were praying. What do you imagine they were praying? Well, I know exactly what they were praying. And I think it's the key to what detonated this bomb. You see, in a few, oh, a few uh, months back, they had asked Jesus, because they had seen Jesus always praying. As busy as he was, as much as he did, he was a man of prayer. And so they went to him, and Luke, it says, they said, don't teach us how to pray. They said, teach us to pray. And that's when in Matthew he says, when you pray, you pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And that means honored be your name. Father, we want to honor your name. So I know exactly what they were praying. As they were waiting for this to come to pass, they were honoring the name of God. They were before the throne. And I can just imagine them saying, they were calling out one by one, one would call out Elohim, which, is mean, which means the Lord God, which means the all-powerful creator. <coughs> then another one would say, El Elyon, which is God most high. And they're praying, we know you're, you're over us, we know you're <coughs> over this whole earth, we don't know what's going on, but we know you are El Elyon, you are God most high. And then they would call out, El Shaddai, which is God Almighty. And they're saying, we need this power. We don't know what it is, but we know that if it comes, it's coming from you because you are El Shaddai, God Almighty. And then they would say, you are Jehovah, which is our covenant keeper. And that they would acknowledge in prayer that Christ brought a new covenant because the Holy Spirit would bring the words of that last supper to their minds and say, this is the blood of the new covenant. And they would know Jehovah is the one who keeps the covenant because he is Lord. And then they would call out for El Olam, which is God everlasting. And it was up to God who was before all and will be at the end of all. If anyone is to have power, if anyone is to have might in this world, it is from God everlasting because he's the source of all power. And then they would call out Jehovah Roi, Lord, our shepherd. These, these were men who were just weeks before were, were dumb sheep. They had run. Peter had denied Christ. And, and they were lost without their shepherd. And now they were praying, calling out for Jehovah Roi because he is the shepherd. And they knew they were dumb sheep. They would cry out Jehovah Jireh, God who provides. And they know that once, when they thought Christ was dead, Christ was gone, that really He was the Passover lamb. He was the provision that God gave mankind. So they called out for Jehovah Jireh. And then they called out Jehovah Shalom. When their hearts wanted to, to scream out because all the world was in turmoil around them, they said, Jehovah Shalom, you are peace. We want your peace in our life. 
They were wanting his peace at this time, as well as his power. And then they called out Jehovah Rophe, the God who heals. And I can just see Peter there crying on his hands and his feet as he's before the altar, saying, God, you are the one who heals. Jesus had given him a second chance. And so he was crying out, heal me, cleanse me, just like David, years before, had said, heal, heal my soul, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. And then they were crying out, Jehovah Sudkanu, which is God, our righteousness. Every man there, all 120 of them, knew that they were guilty of nailing Christ to the cross. They knew that they had betrayed him. They had run away. They had not, They had abandoned him. And they knew that they had to cling to the righteousness that is Jehovah's, the righteousness that is God's. And then they prayed, Jehovah Nisai, which is God, our banner. And that is what they were lifting up. Because they had no strength. They had no righteousness. They had nothing in themselves that was worthy of any strength before these men that they were called to minister to. So they had to lift up the banner of God. And then they called out Jehovah Shammah. And that means, God, you are here. They knew as they prayed. They knew they were before God Almighty and that He was there. And then they cried out, Jehovah Mekadeh I told you I can't pronounce that one. But it means God who sanctifies them. And if anyone was going to take this ragtag band of people and mold them into the mightiest bomb on earth, it was going to be God who sanctifies, God who sets apart. So I know that's what they were doing. They were honoring God. They were honoring His name. But not only that, the next thing he says, when you pray, you pray, Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I see a group of people who before, when they talked about the kingdom, they were just arguing over who was going to be first or second. Who was going to be doing this? Who was going to be doing that? Who would have the honor? But I see men and women as they knelt and prayed, they didn't care about what they had. They knew they had nothing. They were giving it all. They were surrendering it all. It was all God. It was all about what God wanted. It was all about what His will was. And they were surrendering totally to God's will. And when they prayed, you know, it never amazes me how sometimes Sister Susie can get upset over what some other sister says about maybe the way she dresses. Or maybe sis, Brother Peter gets mad because some, some other body in the church forgets his birthday. It's always something little, little, little like that in the church that tends to, to irritate people. You ever got irritated in church? It's not that hard, you know? I was feeling great when I came to church. I get excited about coming to preach. And then everybody starts looking at me like I'm death warmed over. <laughs> and so you know, I just start to hurt the sink and go, man, I'm feeling bad now. I guess I'm not getting well. <laughs> oh, God dang it. Everybody's giving me the cough drops and everything. It's just like, that. leave me alone. <laughs> you know, when you're kneeling before the throne of God, when His desire is all your desire, when His will is all your will, when His name, His holiness, His power, His ability, His might is all that is God is possessing you. What Sister Susie says or what Sister Brother Peter said, it doesn't bother. It's going to roll right off your back. And this prayer united them. <coughs> But you know what? It did more than that. Once it united them, it ignited them. It, it put a, a passion in their heart, a passion in their soul, that they desired God and His power and His glory more than anything else. I hope. You know, it, it, it's, it's one thing to pray by yourself before God. But I hope that sometime in your life, 
you have someone that when you get with them and you pray, it just puts a fire in you. I have one guy. For some reason, God put us together in Bible college just a couple years ago. And, and more than a week, about five or six times, we would pray four, five, six, one time all night long. And we did a couple revivals together. You know, during that prayer, God knitted our souls together. And so there have been times in my life when I've, I've felt like I've been abandoned or, or used or, or just uh, washed up and, and God didn't have anything else for me or was through with me. Can I give him a call? And we would pray. And you know what? That prayer puts that fire back in you. It ignites you. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, and I think as the Lord leaves me, I've had a couple of people ask, I, I would like in the next few months, maybe a few weeks if God leads, is one or two Wednesday nights, is to not have any, not meet downstairs, but to come up here and in this church, pray. And just pray. And cry out. Because I think this church needs to rediscover the uniting and the igniting power of prayer. You know, there's there's something about when you pray together with other people and you cry, how it, it cleanses, how it energizes. Well, that's what was going on here with these people. Brother Gary, bless his heart, we, we wanted to do this discipleship thing, and it looks like we're going to start to get it off the ground. Operation <coughs> Multiplication. Well, we're asking two people to team up and to train one another, meet once a week, and train each other in how to go through this discipleship thing. And you know, I'm praying that some people will have, have a burden in their heart because this is a chance for you to have someone to pray with to grow with. We can't, we can't have this explosion if we're all just disconnected out here. We've got to be connected by prayer. It's by prayer. No, I, uh, I like technical things, believe it or not. And I was wondering about this mighty rushing wind, this sound that happened. And I got to thinking, what wonder how loud that sound was. Anybody know how loud it was? I want to give you some hints. You can go to that slide. I'll give them a little preview. Uh, normal sound is 70 decibels. A whistle is 40 decibels. Now, if, you, if you've got a gal that can really scream, the loudest she'll get is 128 decibels at 8 feet. Okay. Now, at 128 decibels, also, your hair starts to crawl a little bit. You ever heard a sound so much it feels like it's making your scalp crawl? That's 128 decibels. 133 decibels is the average gunshot. Although, like a 44 Magnum, it can get up to 160 decibels. Now, 140 is a blast of wind. Okay, so we know that one. Now, 143 decibels... If you're exposed to that kind of sound, you'll start to feel like you're being tackled in your chest. Okay? 145 decibels, your, your eyes start to vibrate, and it can affect your vision. Now, if you like hot rods, 163 decibels is a NHRA dragster, liquid nitroglycerin fuel. That's how loud that is. Okay? Pretty loud. Um, 174 decibels the air starts to heat up from the pressure. Now, I think that's significant. That gives us a hint. At 180 decibels, one pound of TNT at 15 feet. That's If you had a pound of TNT, you lift the fuse, let it off, you're 15 foot away, that's 180 decibels. 195 decibels, 50% of eardrums will puncture. Okay? 212 is a sonic boom. 240 decibels is an F5, 300 mile an hour tornado. Anybody ever see that tornado movie 
still is what they're using. But F5 tornado. If they would have turned that sound up to where you could really hear how high it was, everybody's ear drum and the auditorium would have been punctured. There was no way that sound was as high as, high as it was. The largest sound or highest sound they estimate, I guess, 310 decibels is the Krakatoa volcano exploding <coughs> in 1883, 93, somewhere there. The reason they know it was that loud because 300 miles away, 12 inch concrete got cracked through. It is amazing how much sound. Now, I'm not scientific, I have no scientific proof, but if I were to say how loud was this, this sound, I would say it was between 174 and 240 decibels. Why 174? Because I know there were tongues of fire. And I know those came from the Holy Spirit. But man, that was fire. It was hot. And with 174 decibels, that's when the, the, hair, the air starts to heat up. But I'm really thinking it was about 190 because I don't think God wanted the eardrums first. Do you? you don't, I don't think so. But anyway, I don't think we realize how, how loud this was. But I'm thinking about 190 decibels just above a TNT explosion. Now that's pretty wild, isn't it? Now, Jim, it doesn't matter. Well, what matters is that you had prayer detonating. What was the explosive power? The explosive power was the Holy Spirit. He was the one just waiting for that time, that place, that moment to explode. I've got a little picture of the dove. And I love doves. Does anybody hunt doves here? No one hunts doves, do they? Oh, I'm sorry, I see one. Well, not the white dove, but I, I, put a, I put some TNT with this dove. Because we think of the dove of peace, the Holy Spirit of dove of peace. But I'm telling you, this day, the Holy Spirit... He brought some TNT with him. He set off the father of all bombs. I mean, this, this bomb that exploded was not one that caused damage like we think of it. But it was shaking <coughs> the devil. It was stripping away the flesh. It was slaying mankind's idea of what they thought is religion. This was a bomb that was more powerful than Krakatoa. Did you know when Krakatoa went off? Then it, it shot up th uh, debris 34 miles into the air. And debris ran, rain all over the earth for about 10 days after the explosion. It sent shock waves so powerful that they traveled 36 times around the earth for a solid month. That's how powerful that explosion was. But the explosion that went off on Pentecost, when, when prayer ignited the Holy Spirit... That, that, that has been going on from time immemorial. From, from that day till now, we have that power. Now, it, it doesn't say it was wind, but I believe that wind is like you can't see, but they called it wind. And why would wind be associated with that? You know, God uses wind to show his blessing. When he was leading the Israelites through from Egypt, how did he part the water? He used wind to part it and, and he, to dry the ground. And when they were hungry for meat, what did he use? How did he use wind? He sent the wind to get the quail and drop them down from the sky. God used wind to show his blessing. But God used wind to show his power also and his presence. You know, Elijah was, had just done a mighty miracle of, uh, of seeing the, the fire come down and devour. And, and, and for some reason, he just ran. And he got to thinking, oh, Jezebel's after me. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm all alone. Nobody's here. And all of a sudden, God spoke up. And God sent a blast of wind and shook a mountain with it. He said, see, you're not alone. I have power. In fact, there's 7,000 more that are beside you. But God uses wind to shake us up and, and to, to get us to turn to Him. You know, Jonah was running away from God. 
He didn't want to go preach to those Ninevites. And God sent that wind to shake that, that ship up and, and said, no, you're not going anywhere. You're not running away from me. He sent a wind and it caused Jonah to go through what he did. That's what wind does. You know, wind moves things. Wind can take a huge ship and just toss it as if there's nothing there. And sometimes we need wind to, to move stubborn objects. Sometimes God puts wind in our life to shake us up and to get us to do what He wants. And wind is a sign of the Spirit bringing life. Look at Ezekiel 37. <coughs> Ezekiel 37. <coughs> First verse. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around and behold, there were very many in the open valley and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, Oh Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones. And say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Talk about a preacher preaching to a dead house. <laughs> you know, that would take a lot of faith to, to start preaching to a bunch of bones. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard enough preaching to living people. <laughs> so, so I prophesied as I was, I said, I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a noise suddenly a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed as I looked the sinews and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them over but there was no breath in them. And he said to me boy Joe, you could use that verse this morning about those kids. There was no breath in them. They were kind of clueless. Well, that's what Ezekiel was saying. There's no breath. And he said, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, sons of man. And say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these same lame that they may live. So I prophesied. As he commanded me, and breath came into them. They lived, stood upon their feet in exceedingly great army. You know that Holy Spirit can bring even the driest of bones back to life. Mm -hmm. And these 120 people who just days before were ready to give it all up, thought that their world was all over. The Holy Spirit, as they prayed, ignited them and He brought life into their life, into their, their soul. God can do that. And He is doing that. The second thing that they saw was the visible signs of tongues of fire. The cloven, cloven tongues. You know, fire is used to illustrate, it's actually, fire is the presence of God. Who was it? Moses, in the, in, as he was tending sheep, he saw a fire going, thought it was nothing, big deal, until he noticed it wasn't being consumed. He walks up and he hears a voice saying, take off your sand. Holy ground. This is the fire of God. Fire is used to reveal His power because when, when they uh, were trying to leave from Egypt, the Egyptians thought they had all kinds of gods. They didn't need any other god. They didn't need to obey Him. And God sent fiery hail from heaven and said, this is my power. This is what kind of God I am. Fire is, is used to bring light and darkness. That's how the uh, when, when the Israelites were in the wilderness, the light would come and show them the way and, and show the path to travel. Fire is used to reveal His glory. When, when the, the people would put down a burnt offering, some, the, the fire would come from heaven, just like when, uh, Ezekiel, when uh, Elijah had the fire come down from heaven. The fire showed God's power, and also it showed His presence. And that's why when that sacrifice is burned, and it ascends to heaven. That is a sign 
that God is pleased. God, His presence is there. You know, fire is used to reveal His supremacy like Elijah did. Fire is used to illustrate His protection. And one thing that one thing I like about God is whenever He calls you to do something, He affirms it in some way. And when the Israelites were coming back to rebuild the, the temple, rebuild the walls, there was one moment when they were just they, they despaired for their life. And, and God sent a word from Zechariah. He said, For I will be a wall of fire all around her, and I will be glory in her midst. He was talking about the work that they were going to do. You know, I believe that if we as a church commit to doing something for God, if we unite, if we ignite, God will be a wall of fire around us as we pursue His will. Fire is used to describe the nature of God's Word. How many of you pick up this Word and think of it as fire? Some of you pick it up and think, boy, this is hard to figure out. But you know, this is the fire of God. This Word has the power to ignite men's passions. It has the power to accelerate a church to where they follow after God. It has the power to make us be the disciples of need to be. You know, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They yielded to His power. They yielded to His control. They surrendered to Him. And when you're empty, when you've given up everything then what else do you have? You have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Over the next few weeks, as we look through Acts, I'm praying that God will give us clues on how we can seek after this power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm praying that God will raise up some people that will pray, Father, Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And then also do that which the Bible illustrates we must do to see that that happens. But let me explain one thing. What happened here was not oh, some power that just fell upon these people. The Holy Spirit is not just some, some bomb. And I, I, I use that just to see the parallel but he was not just a bomb that fell. He's not just some force that comes upon you. The Holy Spirit, if you study the Holy Spirit like we did last year, he, is, he has all the earmarks of personality. He is a person. He is a person of the Trinity. He is God. And the Holy Spirit doesn't just fall on you. What happens is the Holy Spirit desires to live through you. And so we don't, there's not, I'm not walking around here, I got more of the Holy Spirit. That somebody out here is not walking around going, I got more of the Holy Spirit. But the thing is that some of us are more yielded to the Holy Spirit than others. And that's what it's about, is that we're yielded to the Holy Spirit's control. We don't get more of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gets more of us. That's what He desires. And when these disciples were uniting and, and, and igniting, when they were yielding, when they were surrendering, they got to the place where the Holy Spirit says, Okay, I'm going to get all of you. I'm going to get all of you. And that's what caused that mob to go off. So, be careful when you pray for the Holy Spirit. It's not something to be grabbed. But He's a person who desires to live in you. And control you. You know, D.L. Moody in 1871, there were some, some old grandmothers that were sitting up front. For some reason, God had put it on their heart to start praying for, for D.L. Moody to get the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. And that was the, the, the same year that his church burnt down in the Chicago fire. And so he was over in, in New York and he was seeking money to help rebuild the, the church. 
And these, he had met with these gals for a few, a few weeks, praying on Friday, because he had this longing in his heart for the power of the Holy Spirit. And he had been praying while he was walking the streets of New York, just trying to raise money. He said, and let me, let me quote, it says, it says, oh, what a day, I cannot describe it. I seldom refer to it. It's almost too sacred an experience to me. I can only say that God revealed himself to me, and I had such an experience of his love that I had to ask him to stay his hand. I went to preaching again. The sermons were not different. I did not present any new truths, and yet hundreds were converted. D.L. Moody admits that there came a time in his life when before it was dry, but after he was filled with the Spirit of God. And then the fourth thing that they did is they began to speak in other languages. And this is, they were speaking the wonderful works of God. You know, if you're kneeling in prayer, if you're before the throne, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, what are you going to say? You're just going to start praising God, aren't you? You're going to be praising Him and saying glory to Him. And you're going to be praising Jesus Christ because He's your Savior. And that's what they were doing. But let me make one point clear. What happened here? On this day when this bomb went off, this is not what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 14. Because what happened here at Pentecost was never duplicated again. When anyone else spoke in what they call tongues, it was not with another language that somebody else out here could sit and hear and understand. This was a special occasion, a special preordained time. And I'll tell you why. But when prayer ignites the power of the Holy Spirit, it produces mighty works for the witness of Jesus Christ. And that's what happened. This was not some display of some super spiritual people. In fact, the people in the crowd, when they saw the, when they heard the, the languages, they were saying, well, aren't these ignorant Galileans? Because the Galileans talked, uh, have you ever heard of, I'm not picking on southern languages, but have you ever, have you ever had someone that's supposed to be an expert on something, and they're talking in this Billy Bob drawl? Doesn't it just seem to not work the same that, you kind of wonder, and I'm not picking on that because I, I love southern accents, but sometimes, that's why you don't see many newscasters using that southern accent. They, they have our, our Midwest accent. But the Galileans were the type that when they talked, you, you heard their accent, and it immediately said to you, hick. That's what it was. They were fishermen hicks. And these people here and they could tell. And all of a sudden they hear them speaking their language, but with a hick Galilean accent. And they knew something was up. God was behind this. Because this was a miracle that they could do that. And that's what it was. It was a miracle for the express purpose of lifting Jesus Christ up. And any time God does a miracle in the scriptures and acts, when you see what, what the Holy Spirit is doing, it is for the express purpose of presenting Jesus Christ. It's for him to lift him up. Now, why did it happen at this time, this moment? You know, the, the springtime was a time of festivals for the Jews. It was commanded that you go and celebrate these festivals. The first one was Passover, which was April, uh, well, the first month of their calendar, the 14th. And that was the Passover celebration that commemorated the Passover lamb. And that's why Paul wrote that Jesus is our Passover. He died as our Passover lamb. Mm -hmm. And in the second feast, when everyone was supposed to be in Jerusalem, Josephus writes that during this time that the population of Jerusalem spread from a will swell from 150,000 to over a million people. And so the second one was on the Sunday after Passover. And that feast was called the Feast of the First Fruits. 
And do you know why Jesus rose on Sunday? Because he, the scripture says, is the first fruits. And so that's why he rose on that day. And then the Pentecost was 50 days after that Passover Sabbath. And the Passover was called the Feast of Harvest. That's when you brought your the, the, the bread that was made from the harvest. You brought it to the storehouse. And that's why on this day, the Holy Spirit came, the Holy Spirit empowered, the Holy Spirit gave the miracles, was to begin God's harvest of His church. That's why it happened on this day. God ordained it. What does this mean to me? What does it mean to you? First of all, when, when Jesus said that you shall receive power, you shall receive power when you're clothed on power, from power on high. The second premise of that is that the reason you receive power is why? To look good? Sorry, I didn't work. <laughs> it's to witness, right? He had a reason to witness, to evangelize. That, in other words, no matter what they had learned from him, no matter what verses they had memorized, it was not good enough to evangelize this world. It had to be ignited. The power had to be upon them so that they could witness with power. Now, is world evangelism over? Is it? No, it's not. It is not complete. So if it is not complete, is the power no longer needed? Is the power no longer needed? Is the power no longer needed? Say no. no. It is needed. The power is still there. The power is still needed. If we're going to be an effective witness for Jesus Christ, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. There is nothing in my Bible that says there is no more need for power after Pentecost. Is it in your Bible? Then why do we stop praying for the power? of the Holy Spirit. Why do we stop uniting in prayer with one accord in seeking the, 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 to glorify God, to seek His kingdom here on earth? There is no reason to stop. There is a greater need for prayer. The promise of this extraordinary power that Jesus gave them still applies to you and me today. You know, I read an article goes way back, about three years after I was born. The only time a U.S. Navy pilot shot himself down, it was in an F-11 Tiger, and he was he was doing target practice with their 20 millimeter shells or whatever they're called, and he was shooting, and. It was, and then he started descending, but something happened and he, he kind of sped up or whatever. And all of a sudden he's hearing, uh, he's got a crack in his windshield, his motor's going, his, his engine's going down, and he has to, he has to bail out. His, his, uh, his plane is, is, is destroyed, is going down. And they discovered later on that somehow he had actually flown into his own bullets. He had gone that fast. He shot himself down. The only time in history that that's ever happened to a U.S. pilot. Now, here's our problem. We go so fast in our world. You've got so much going on. How much time do you spend in prayer? How much time do you spend before the throne? How much time do you spend beseeching God for His power in your life. You know, if we go so fast, we're going to shoot ourselves down. We need the power of God in our life. We need to take time to pray. You know, the, the thing that happened is all these people, these 15 or so languages that are mentioned, they, they saw what was happening. It says there in verse 12 or 13, he says, uh, and all were amazed and perplexed. But the perplexity gave way to two different responses. 
They said, what does this mean? Or, these people are drunk. And those two responses are here today. There's going to be people that say, doesn't apply. I don't want to get crazy. I, I don't want to change the way I am. I don't want people calling me drunk. But you know that question that says, what does this mean? It's a poor translation. Young's literal says, what would this wish to be? Because the word there for mean or wish is the word thalo, which actually indicates desire. And the question that would be asked, you should ask yourself today, is what is my desire? What is God's desire? Amen. That day at Pentecost, God's desire, man's desire, met. And when they met, there was an explosion. There was miracles. There was an outreach. The, the such that this world has never seen before. And this morning, the Holy Spirit is looking into your heart and saying, What is your desire? Do you desire me? Do you desire me in fullness? Do you desire my presence? You can go away saying, what does this mean? You can go until Tuesday or Wednesday will be totally forgotten. Or you can go and say, eh, nothing to do with that. It's your. But I pray that some people that God will start to light a fire in your heart. That this void that's in your life, God will start to say, hey, just let me in. Just let me in. Would you start desiring me? Would you start desiring to be filled with my Holy Spirit? There's, there could be a bomb still go off. God can light this church. He'll take our prayer meaning with God's desire. Empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we just give ourselves to you. You are our righteousness. You are our peace. You are our sanctification. It's all been made possible through your Holy Spirit. I pray, God, that you will work in our hearts and desire.